Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Get Schooled on Public Education podcast. I'm your host, Brittany Baker. And remember, charter schools are public schools. We're live in Austin, Texas at the National Charter Schools Conference, hosted by the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. And I'm so inspired by our guest, Luma Mufle. Luma is one of our keynote speakers for the conference. She's also an author, refugee activist, and the founder of the nonprofit Fuji's Family, which oversees Fuji's Academy, two schools located in Georgia and Ohio. Thank you so much for joining us today, Luma. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, Luma is the author of Learning America, One Woman's Fight for Educational Justice for Refugee Children, which we have with us today. Uh, Fuji's Academy is dedicated to advancing educational justice for refugee and immigrant youth. Um, Can you describe your advocacy journey and what led you to open Fuji's Academy? I think it was like an unlikely um, road to starting schools. Um, It started off as a pickup soccer game in a parking lot. I was uh, born and raised in the Middle East in Amman, Jordan. came to college, ended up in the South. You can read more about that in the book as to why. But I was on my way to a Middle Eastern grocery store to pick up authentic hummus and pita bread, missed my turn, had to U-turn into this apartment complex. And when I was there, I saw kids playing soccer with rocks set up as goals. And um, they were playing barefoot, and it reminded me of home. Um, I had been a club soccer coach at the time, had a soccer ball in my car, uh, brought it out. The boys rushed. They wanted the ball, I wanted to play, we haggled, the rest is history. Um, and then once I got to know my, my kids and my players, I realized um, that they couldn't read or write. Um, and that was really hard for me to reconcile because my parents sent me to British and American schools growing up because they believed that was the best the world had to offer. And I believed all schools in America were like the state department run American high school I went to. And they were not. And that was not okay. And what about the charter school model made you think that it was the best way to serve these communities? So initially in Georgia, we started off as a private school. So private school for a zero tuition private school. Um, And we applied to be a charter and we were denied um, because we had asked for our lottery to prioritize our community. So many charter schools start off prioritizing a certain community and then shift because the neighborhood gentrified or pressures to, you know, get different results. And I wanted to make sure that we had this in our charter that we would prioritize our community. Um, And at that hearing, I was told by uh, one of the commissioners that uh, she was not gonna approve a school that discriminated against white middle-class kids. And I was just like, oh, (laughs) This is, <laughs> I didn't expect to hear that. Um, so it continued as a private school. And then, you know, the law was changed in um, Georgia that allowed you to weigh the lottery right. for EL and income. And so uh, when we applied for our charter, no one had used that lottery, but it was there. And so we stacked it heavily. Um, when I was talking at someone who's helped me with the application, she's like, well, what do you want to ensure? I said, well, I want to make sure that my daughter can't come to this school. And she's like, all charter school leaders want their kids to go to the schools. I said, no, I want her to come, but she, I don't want her to get in because she shouldn't be taking up a seat that another kid deserves more. So. And let's dig a little deeper here. What are some of the key things we need to think about when serving refugee and immigrant students and families, and how do we get to those solutions? I mean, I think we need to factor in that it's not a monolith. Right, so you usually get English language learners and it's like the same approach, the same funding, the same solution. And the kids we specialize in are ones that haven't had any formal education or their education was disrupted. So not only are they English language learners, some of the kids we work with don't know letters of the alphabet. That's a very different approach than an immigrant who is literate. Um, And then you have to factor in all the things that may prevent learning. Right? So is, are there stresses at home? Are there immigration policies that weigh down on the kids? Like you've got to factor in every piece. And I tell my team when we're designing for solutions, we should walk in their shoes. And then we can start seeing, oh, we forgot to factor this in. Too often when we design solutions, we walk in our own shoes and we don't walk in 
I love our that. community I shoes. I love that walk in their shoes. Yep. Can you share a story about how a student or family was positively impacted by Fuji's Academy? There's just, there's so right. many. Um, I think of, there's this one kid, um, he came in mid-year, so in October, November, mid-semester, um, came from the Democratic Republic of Congo, didn't know a word of English, was a hot mess, like as all middle schoolers are, right? And so, uh, biggest challenge was first getting him in his uniform, tie a tie, and like show up regularly. Um, and uh, we share our grades in our schools, and so, um, you know, the court, uh, the term came and he had to share his grades and he had the report card upside down, couldn't read it, you know, yeah. and it was all F's anyway. And so I was standing next to him and I read it. Um, and then end of the semester, he was able to read it. A lot of F's still, <laughs> some C's. Everybody started clapping because every kid in that room had seen what had transpired, you know, and it's like, pretty powerful when you know you've got a community that's got your back when you're struggling, when you're failing, and when you're succeeding. Um, I've seen kids who, you know, have ended up going to college or entered apprenticeships when all the data showed it's not going to happen. Um, I've had girls who got pregnant during their time and finished school and are now on a path uh, in community college, right? And it's like, you've got to have their back no matter what and show them the possibilities. Like you're gonna hit a bump. Right. Um, and I think in some ways it's easier for our kids to grasp that because they've had to like uproot their entire lives, right? So the little bumps that here in the United States we consider huge bumps, they're like, no, like I, I can do this. It's not that, it's not as hard as leaving my country, right? And um, diving into um, the insight you've gained over the years, mm -hmm. what are some of the key lessons you've learned during your advocacy journey? Um, I've had to learn where to give a little bit and where to like not compromise at all. Um, and not to compromise at the cost of my kids, right? That what I should be advocating for and fighting for is what's best for them, not, not what makes other people comfortable. And I've had to learn that the hard way. Um, and that they're not to be on display, right? Um, and to show them as assets, like too often our community is shown as a deficit. And I want people to see us in all the beauty and strength and resilience. Um, and I've gotten uh, a lot better at asking for money. I hated it, I hated it, I hated it, I hated public speaking. And a friend was like, you do it because of what happens after you do it. Like you've got to step out of your comfort zone and adv that's what being an adv uh, activist is, so. And a part of your mission is to advance educational justice for refugee and immigrant youth. Mm -hmm. um, how can our listeners support you in your mission? I think uh, listeners should pay attention to the policies that keep refugee and immigrant kids, um, you know, where they can't succeed. Uh, there's this like one asinine policy that says English language learners get a waiver from state testing for one year. I'm like, you expect them to be at grade level in one year? Like, mm -hmm. that's just stupid, mm -hmm. you know? Like, so pay attention to, and not, not accept, well, that's just the way it is. It's like, well, that is, it doesn't mean it's right. Um, and think about like what you would want if you had left your home, what you would want in a school environment if you had left your home, what you would want in your community if you had left your home. Um, I recently read, um, uh, Dave Eggers is a kid's book. It's called Her Left Foot, and it was about the Statue of Liberty, her right foot, sorry. It's about the Statue of Liberty, and he highlighted that the Statue of Liberty's leg is actually lifted. Mm -hmm. It's not standing still. It's in motion, right. and so it's in motion to welcome people in, not waiting for them to come to us, and that's what America is about. We should be bring people in, you know, that right. make our country better and that need to heal. 
Well, I love that. And just thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you for all that you do for students and families. Thank you for sharing your passion and your mission with us. Thank you for having me. Of course, we really appreciate you. Um, again, uh, Luma Mufle, author, refugee activist, and founder of Fuji's Family. I'm your host, Brittany Baker, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Get Schooled on Public Education podcast. Produced by HeartCast Media.